Hey, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. You are listening to the PM Show, and I am one part of your amazing hosting duo. What is this? Duo, trio? What is this, Danica? What is this? Uh, We are the terrible twosome. Tonight we're the terrible twosome. I've got some pretty big announcements tonight. So, um, like I said, I am Mandy Parsons, one half of your dynamic terrible twosome. And uh, Danica the Great is here with me as she is on a weekly basis. Hello, Danica. Hi, Mandy. Yay, I'm here. It's been a it's been a crazy week, but I'm happy to be on the show. Oh, crazy week for us both, man. I I have hours of stuff to talk about, but we only have two hours to fill. Um, I do want to say this, that uh, Ken the Liberty Phoenix Ottinger should be joining us the second hour. I am very pleased about this, but I could be biased just a little biased. No, not not biased at all. <laughs> yeah, just just a little. Um, so he'll be joining us the second hour. I'm very excited about that. Um, I do want to make a somewhat huge-ish announcement, and uh, I, I don't think it will really come as any shock, but... Uh, John Moreland, who was my sidekick, and actually I I shouldn't call him a sidekick. I always build us as co-host. John has decided that the PM show is not what his heart is calling him to do anymore. He decided that he wanted to be a rodeo clown for the rest of his life, and he has gone to pursue being a professional rodeo clown for the rest of his life. Uh, in all seriousness, John will come back and fill in for me uh, from time to time, but uh, just like any good projects or endeavors in life, this is just not one that John wants to pursue. So um, on a better note and a more very exciting and thrilling note for me, uh, Miss Danica the Great will be my permanent co-host. Yay, it's exciting to be, I mean, it's exciting to not only hang out with you because you are my friend, but I really enjoy being able to talk to you about, you know, current issues that are going on right now that that really concern me. And I know that for the most part, that even if you may not necessarily agree with what I say, um, you can find some benefit in knowing what it is and that we, you know, do attempt to report on the very um, uncommon, unspoken news that the mainstream media just really doesn't cover. So I really enjoy the two hours that we get to hang out together. Um, if not anything, we just get to kind of BS for two hours. It's awesome. Absolutely. And, you know, the biggest thing about this, it's not easy to find somebody who's willing to come on the air on a weekly basis and do it voluntarily just because of the fun of it and um, making a name for yourself coverage, whatever the reason might be. It is not easy to find somebody who's willing to come on the air. And I know at first you had your reservations about it for, you know, personal reasons, but you, you didn't stop, you didn't waver. And here you are. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really good. Yeah, it's really good to do that. And you, you know, definitely made some progress in what I guess I shouldn't say progress because not everyone's going to believe the same thing. So that's probably um, not right of me to say that. And I apologize. But you know, you've definitely you know you've experienced an evolution in your kind of political freedom thinking, just like I have. You know, started from the I personally started from being in a very uh, Republican to conservative home, uh, then going to moderate, then going to independent. And then eventually I got involved in the freedom movement, so therefore I became libertarian, and then from there I became a voluntarist, and now I'm slowly heading into anarchism. So you know, it's been a it's been a great evolution. I've met really awesome people along the way. I've met tons and tons um, of informational materials. I've experienced a lot of things myself. So it's just, it's been an awesome journey, and I'm so glad that you're on the journey as well. Thank you. And yes, I am. Um, it, it's not easy. It's not easy, especially when you live in a dual paradigm world of right, left, right, left, right, left, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. And that's the only way people know how to relate things. If you happen to mention the Libertarian Party, they'll be like, that they'll treat the Libertarian Party like they are the, uh, the red-headed stepchildren. So you can talk about Republicans, Democrats, everything can be fine. Maybe throw in the term Libertarian, but if you throw in voluntarism, anarchism, um, anarchism or the non-aggression principle, you've gone on a completely different tangent that most people have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's um, Sometimes it's really hard trying to discuss it, such as with my mother, for example. She doesn't um, She doesn't quite understand some of the uh, 
the things that are brought up because she thinks that there has to be some sort of government control. And so we go back and forth sometimes on when I tell her, no, mom, that's not really something that's needed. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's been interesting. You know, she doesn't, I wouldn't say it doesn't understand it. I just don't think she really wants to try and understand it because she's kind of got this mindset block. But, you know, that's just what, uh, that's what progress, progress does. And I have the same problem with my parents. Uh, you know, I, I talk to my mother. My mom's not closed-minded. She says, I'm not Republican, I'm not Democrat, I'm not anything. And she doesn't mean it in the fact that she's not active. Um, she's gotten better about contacting her representatives, not to get them to vote or to show support, just to say, what the heck are you all doing up there? You know, she's she's on the slow track, but she still has a hard time believing that organizations like the USDA or the FDA could possibly be harmful to you. And I, you know, the mindset I have at first, I was like, well, you know, I have my reservations too, but the more you get into this movement and the more that you learn about how corrupt government is, well, these are, those are just two more branches of government. So why is it not okay uh, why is it that, uh, excuse me, that the other government parts are not okay? Like the president, he's not okay. His cabinet, he's not okay. Why do we trust that they are not good people and they're harming us, but we still place all this faith? And I shouldn't use the collective we. This is something that, that Liberty Phoenix and I have actually talked about, the collective statements that I'm using. And he claims that still makes me a little bit of a statist, but we'll talk about that. Um, but what makes it okay for the President of the United States and the Cabinet to be evil and bad and causing people in America harm, but the USDA and the FDA, which are still government organizations, are supposed to be good for the people in the United States? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, hopefully peaceful evolution comes through and she has a way of really seeing what it is. I mean, I've known, you know, tons of, you know, cop supporters, you know, state supporters to just slowly come into the light. I mean, you let me, you know, quote uh, V for Vendetta, where they were, you know, a famous man once said, you know, if our own government was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, would you really want to know? People now are, you know, in in time, our parents will come to realize that this government that we've grown up with is not, you know, the good old boys that we were expecting. Well, the sad part about this government thing, too, is the fact that I, now that I'm teaching full-time, mm-hmm. I have to teach my kids social studies, and the only thing I look at is how much of this is the truth and how much of it is a lie. And I look at it, and I see that even if we're telling something that's the truth, they totally could have put a spin on it to make it something awful. You know, the South, for instance, uh, I just taught my kids recently about how Andrew Johnson was Abraham Lincoln's predecessor, um, successor rather, and after all the land was confiscated from the South and given to the blacks when they gained their freedom, he took it back from the black people and he gave it back to the Southerners who owned it before the war. And I was just, to me, that says, you know, that that's the right thing to do. I don't care how horrible the people were who owned it, and the only reason they were horrible is because they owned slaves. But I had to remind my kids, I said, well, slavery is a horrible thing. It wasn't illegal at the time. You know, nope. not that law should play a part in it. Morally, we should just decide that it's horrible to treat other human beings like that. However, it wasn't illegal at the time, so technically they weren't doing anything wrong. And we're painting them to be horrible people. Did they treat them badly? A lot of them did, sure. But at the same time, they still owned the land. It was still their land. So just because they did something horrible that at the time was not illegal doesn't mean the government can come in and steal that land from them and give it to black people just because they were oppressed. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, so I told my kids, I was like, how many of you think that this is wrong? They're like, oh, Andrew Johnson's a bad man. I said, why is Andrew Johnson a bad man? Because he took the land away from the blacks and gave it back to the southern plantation owners. I said, so? I said, don't get me wrong, kiddos. Slavery is a bad thing. I said, but let's put it this way. Say that there was a massive, tragic, natural disaster, and your house was was looted. 
you found out that your best friend came in and stole your brand new state of the art seven hundred dollar video game system. And that person who stole it, they couldn't afford one, so they just decided it would be easier to come in and steal yours. Yeah, I uh this actually reminds me of something really funny. This man um owns a YouTube channel called Ownage Pranks, very funny guy. And he got a request to do a prank, and this one I thought was like a little insensitive, but I mean it, it was funny. But basically, he calls people at random, and he does like a number of different kinds of accents and things, and he's able to keep a straight face through a lot of it, which is really impressive to me. But basically, he got a request to call a prank on this man who had just had a bunch of things stolen from him, such as a very expensive video game system, um, a laptop, and his wallet. And such. So the prank, you know, the person that was calling to do the prank had the voice of said assailant and was pretending to be like the world's dumbest criminal calling him back. And you can you just imagine how infuriating that would be, knowing that the person who stole from you is now trying to be like, oh hey, I'm trying to use your stuff. And obviously that would probably never happen, but you know, just you know, imagine that. That'd be crazy. Yeah, exactly. And after I proposed this thought to my students about how they stole the land and he gave it back. I was like, okay, so your friend steals your state-of-the-art $700 video game system. you going to tell your friend it's okay to keep it even though they stole it because they're less fortunate than you? And they they just looked at me and some of them said, well, yeah, yeah. And I had asked the kids ahead of time, who thinks Andrew Johnson had the wrong idea? And one bunch of them raised their hand. One girl, she didn't raise her hand. And I was like, who thought that Andrew Johnson did the right thing? And one of my students raised her hand, and she goes, well, that land, it it didn't belong to the black people, and you can't come and steal it and just give it away to somebody else. I said, good. Now, what I thought was really interesting about this conversation, I don't want to make it a race issue, but this situation in history deals specifically to race. Mm -hmm. And the kids who raised their hand to say that Andrew Johnson did the wrong thing were my African-American students. And the one who raised her hand and said Andrew Johnson did the right thing was an African American student. I found this extremely in- extremely interesting. Just the dynamics of the conversation and the, and the demographics of the conversation. Once I added the comment about the video game console, one of my students goes, "I see where you're going with this." Uh, of course they would. It's video games, right? And I said, "Okay, so how would you feel?" They're like, "Well, we wouldn't like that." I was like, okay, then why is it okay, even though they did something horrible to those people, why is it okay if for the land that they earned and they paid for to be taken away from them and given to the people that they oppressed just because they oppressed them and it wasn't against the law at the time? And then I told them, I was like, think about it this way. What if the land they confiscated didn't belong to anybody who owned slaves? It happened to be family land that was passed down generation to generation, and it was being farmed by a family, and that's all they had. And it's been in their land, in, in their family for hundreds of years. And the kids said, we never thought about that. I was like, what I'm trying to tell you is it's not okay no matter what the deed is. If a person owns something, no matter how bad they are, if they owned it and they bought it outright and it was fair, they don't have the right to come in and steal it just because they did bad things. But in the grand scheme of things, Andrew Johnson is painted to be a tyrant and a horrible man. Yeah, I've always known him to be a ty- to be a tyrant, just you know, one of the worst people that would ever become president. And this is where I question, what have we learned and what have we been teaching for so long that maybe we have the story wrong? You also have to consider people said, oh, it was the North and South and the South was fighting for slavery. And I was like, it's not slavery. It was, it was very clearly states' rights. They felt they had the right, and they did. They did have the right. So the thing is, though, is that people can't put themselves into the shoes of someone else. They fought for what they believed in, and it wasn't, it wasn't the slavery thing. It was they were fighting for what they believed in. And we know that the North wasn't as innocent as they make them out to be either because Abraham Lincoln was a terrible man. Well, how many schools now are teaching with Christopher, you know, teaching on Christopher Columbus, uh, you know, oh, he came and he discovered the new world and made friends with the Indians when no, he likely captured and tortured them, you know, so did all the, so did all the other early explorers. Like, you know, I found out about that out of school. It's true. 
It's true. I learned about how horrible Abraham Lincoln was like three years ago. Now, I was very shocked to learn that they're actually teaching that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves as retaliation to the South for fighting against the North. I was shocked to know that they were actually teaching that because that's the truth. How dare they teach the truth? But the fact of the matter is there's other times throughout history where the story is completely different from what we're being taught. I mean, hell, like you just said, Christopher Columbus was a bad man. Yet we get a day off of school because he was a bad man. Yeah, we get yeah we get a day off from school. Um, federal buildings are closed. Lots of places are observing because of this. It's just, uh, really, like really. Why are we celebrating this man? And if you read the story, he did. He tortured tons of Native Americans. He tortured and and killed people. Oh, it was horrible. It was just horrible, yet we're celebrating this man like he's some kind of hero. And the sad thing is that these people know the kids are not going to do their research. So they get away with this so easily. And just, I really appreciate the work that you're doing to try and, you know, just like you were saying last week, how you were with at the um, parent-teacher conference, and the man said, I am so glad my girl's in your school because you're telling history as it really is, that you're not just covering what was based on these books, that they're getting real information. And, and they are, and I try my best. I don't go, go in to cause any trouble. You know, a lot of people are against the 14th Amendment because it was forced down the Southerners' throats. I mean, the 14th Amendment said that blacks became official citizens of the United States. And a lot of people disagree with this because Abraham Lincoln said to the states, if you don't comply with this, there will be a retaliation. And the whole thing behind it is that states have states' rights for that reason. If the government passes a bill, if the government passes something that the people don't like, the whole point is the state can come back and say, well, we're not going to follow that because we don't believe in it. But he said, if you don't follow this, there will be repercussions. So it was a lot of people consider that to have been illegally passed. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I taught the kids about that today, and I told them why. Am I going to get in trouble? I don't think I'm going to get in trouble for this. If the kids did their own research, they'd find it themselves. So what happens when a kid comes up to me and says all this stuff? You know, what? I, I laughed because there's a kid in my class who came up to me and goes, Miss Parsons. I said, yes. He said, you know, I'm trying to tell my friends, all of them, how bad of a man Abraham Lincoln is, and nobody will listen to me. And I was like, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard, that he's trying to tell his friends what a bad man Abraham Lincoln was. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. So, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm, I'm certainly doing what I can. And I want to address this particular topic later because uh, Liberty Phoenix actually posted an article on his page about um, some – cop car. You know how the cop cars, they confiscate drug money and they turn around and buy the cars with the drug money and it's like some jazzed up super car. And uh, he posted a picture of, I think it was a Cadillac. And so I want to address that again with what I just talked about because it goes along with the same thing. So you're saying it's okay that just because they're bad people that you can take their stuff. Yeah, certainly. Certainly, for sure. Oh, man, sounds like you've had a lot of uh, pent-up things about the school system these days. <laughs> um, you know, I've had some days lately where I walk in and I'm like, why am I doing this? I know. And, yeah, you, know, you have way more patience than me. And for me, I don't particularly, I mean, I enjoy my nieces, but I don't particularly like other people's children. So for you dealing with other people's children, like, you have my respect. That's, yeah, I can't imagine the patience that you'd need to run that job. I love my children. I love them dearly. They do push my buttons. And sometimes I wonder, I'm I just, I'm looking at the kids and I'm like, guys, what are you doing? I mean, you know, they, they do a test. They bomb the test and they're showing me signs of life inside the classroom. So I just don't know. It gets frustrating because they have all these expectations for the kids. And I just, I'm like, why can't we just go back to the days of where we enjoyed teaching? Because if we enjoy the teaching, the kids will enjoy the teaching. And a lot will happen in the classroom. But we're so worried these days about test scores and passing that it's almost a lost cause. Yeah, what about, you know, everyone being, like, too politically correct these days? Like, oh, you can't say that because you might offend someone. Like, everyone's just way too careful these days. It's crazy. 
I haven't had anybody recently talk about political correctness, actually. It's been a while since I've heard anybody mention political correctness. I mean, while we're teaching social studies, we call them the blacks. Some people call them African Americans, but our our books and our curriculum clearly call them blacks. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's really fascinating. It's really, really fascinating. But I'll tell you, you said uh yourself when we got on the show that uh a lot has happened in, in the week. What has been going on in your week? Well, this is I mean this is just mostly um like community kind of things here, but Basically, for me, uh, there was a couple of really frustrating things that happened. Uh, number one is that I, for all you nerds up there, you know that I do enjoy playing games, and I've been playing, um, you know, I've been playing a lot of computer games. Um, doing so, it's kind of a luxury, I know, but I have two monitors. One is usually playing a game. The other one is usually, you know, doing, for either expanding to the game or for looking up information on the other one. And so I think it also makes me very um, productive because I have two screens at work. Um, it allows me to all tab between things very, very efficiently. I would highly recommend anyone if they um, do tend to investing in a second screen because it really just makes your, your work so much easier. But my complaint is that one of the monitors burned out, and I spent about an hour and a half yesterday troubleshooting, trying to find drivers, trying to unplug it. Uh, it's, just, it's been really frustrating, and I'm debating on whether or not it is either the graphics card or monitor itself. I highly doubt it's a graphics card because the computer um, – is barely about a, is barely a year old. Like it's, I want to say it's about a year and a half old, maybe a little bit longer. So I highly doubt it's a graphics card. It sounds like it's a monitor because of the um, the drivers, and I can't I can't keep the monitor plugged in long enough to install the drivers and make it work. So it just it makes it super frustrating whenever I'm trying to start up my said PC. So I am going to you know keep trying to see if there's a way that I can get the drivers installed in it. If not, I'll just have to deal with one monitor until I am able to go get the other one. But um, and then on another note, I have been in, I've been placed in charge with organizing a Halloween party, um, and part of the pr- we're setting up the donations for it. And part of it is that we um, the donations and everything to the party are going to this place called Drew's Defense. Now Drew's Defense will, uh, Drew's Defense is for a young man named Andrew who was arrested on accounts of partially helping out the Silk Road. So um, he's facing a very expensive course case, very expensive fees. His parents have had to put their house on the market, to take out a second mortgage for it, incurring all sorts of expenses. So the purpose of this party is to raise, you know, not only have a good time and provide um, funds for people here in New Hampshire, but we're also trying to get money to go to Drew's defense because we definitely believe that they, they could really use it. He's been a wonderful help to the community, and we definitely want to help him out. Um, on that side of the hotel room, and this is uh, th- this is part of the frustrations that I had, is that we were going to be holding it at a hotel, and I'm not going to you know say which hotel it was, but we when we scheduled for the uh, party, the hotel said that we could have the the ballroom for the said party, but we got an email earlier this week saying that we could not have the party at the ballroom anymore because one of the restaurants had, quote-unquote, already reserved it for their party. And we said, no, you told us that we could have the party. And the saleswoman was beating around the bush telling us, no, that it's all, that's an obligation to the hotel to do so. It's okay, well, you didn't tell us that. You told us here. So not, you know, not only did you lie to us, but you t- chose the absolute worst time to tell us. Because Halloween, you know, while it's still early October, is only a few weeks away. And trying to book a venue for Halloween, which is on a Friday, it's going to be very, very hard, and if it is, it's probably going to be very expensive because they'll want to try and fill up as soon as possible. So for the last few days, we've been trying to contact back and forth with the hotel, and it was super, super frustrating. I was getting all sorts of messages at work because I'm on one of the planning committees, and you know, obviously I couldn't very well take time out of my work schedule to deal with that considering I've just been newly hired on. Thankfully, my job is really um, – they're really flexible – and you know they you know people use their phones all the time at work because sometimes people have to um, they listen to music while they're getting their work done because we work in kind of a loud area. So having phones out is definitely fine. But you know obviously if you're you know taking too much time away during when you're supposed to be working on your phone, then you're probably going to have issues. It's not a problem if you do it during breaks, of course. But like I said, I was getting messages. I kept, my phone was blowing up, and I was like, okay, I can't deal with this one at work. But this is frustrating because I'm on the sports. And I know what the heck I'm supposed to do. Uh, thankfully, uh, something came through, and another venue opened up that um, we're going to be able to work out. So 
that was completely taken care of today after several days of very stress inducing and it was just it was super frustrating. Oh, it sounds like it. It sounds like well you've had frustrating instances. I have had some very good instances, but I will tell you we are gonna to go to a break. So I'm gonna leave this suspenseful and uh Ooh, exciting. It is really exciting. Ah, oh, I can't wait to tell everybody what happened to me. So um, I'm going to go ahead and play some commercials, and we're going to be right back. Yay. Get ready for the epic new documentary adventure ride of your life. Shade the motion picture. Hub you into the globalist domain and embellish a Burma's film. Nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Nothing. Governments do not operate the way you think they do. Banks do not do what you think they do. The police department is not here for what you think it is. Nothing in your world works the way you think it does. We have never let them know that they're a real government that has been identified and they thought they just quit. Speak out. Shade the Motion Picture. Order your copy of the DVD today at ShadeTheMotionPicture.com. You know the Constitution like the back of your hand. You've read books, listened to podcasts, attended lectures, surfed websites, and watched videos. You've made liberty your life's goal. But something seems to be missing. Stickers from LibertyStickers.com. Exercise your freedom of speech with the world's most dangerous bumper stickers. That's LibertyStickers.com. But wait, there's more. You can buy Liberty Stickers wholesale. Get them for 99 cents each when you put 100 or more in your shopping cart in any combination. Sell them or give them away. They're great for gun shows, flea markets, fairs, outreach, and more. Earn extra money, promote freedom, and spread the word. Need custom stickers, labels, or decals for your organization or business? Liberty Stickers makes them. Go to LibertyStickers.com to order or call 877-873-9626. LibertyStickers.com, the world's most dangerous stickers. Vaccines are required for students, employees, immigrants, military members, and international travel. Do you know how to legally avoid them? This is vaccine rights attorney and Freedomizer radio host Alan Phillips. My vaccine exemption ebook can help you avoid the mistakes that have cost others their exemption rights. Get the authoritative guide to vaccine legal exemptions, an ebook available at freedomizerradio.com and vaccinerights.com. Let freedom read. Did you know most Americans know nothing or very little about the legal system? I am the Rose, Rose Colombo, longtime legal activist, legal coach, legal advocate, and the author of Fight Back Legal Abuse, Irwin Award winner, and also my latest political satire, Obamacare Dinosaurs, Rednecks, and Radicals. A political satire exposing the evil agendas of Obamacare and redistribution of wealth that leaves you with a thought-provoking ending. Will mankind survive, or will the U.S. natural-born citizen become extinct? It's available at Amazon.com. You can also visit my website, at www.fightbacklegalabuse.com for more information. So order your copy today and empower yourself with knowledge before injustices come knocking on your back door unexpectedly. I am an autonomous government agent here to steal your livelihood. Not so fast. I'm Sovereign Filing Solutions. And I'm the Sovereign. We're teamed up. To bring you... The truth without censorship. Are you tired of being fed multi-million dollar media lies? Are you ready for the real story? Sovereign Filing Solutions has teamed up with the Sovereign newspaper to make sure you get it. And not the BS this guy behind me wants to feed you. Take the step, help make the change. Oh, come on, that's not even fair. How are we supposed to rule indiscriminately if you know what's going on? 
And we're back. I hope that you guys enjoyed those little tidbits of information that are important to today's society, I'm sure. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that if you are missed the first half hour of our show, you're always welcome to listen to us tomorrow night at YouTube on the Voluntary Virtues Network. We are syndicated every Thursday from 4 to 6 Eastern. I can finally say we are because Danica has uh, just a little a few months ago, moved to the East Coast and joined us here in the real world rather than the mountain time zone. <laughs> so she is also on the East Coast. The show is the PM show, Voluntary Virtues Network, on YouTube, syndicated Thursdays, 4 to 6. Same syndicated means same broadcast, same show. But you can listen to it in its entirety, and if you liked it that much, you can listen to it again anyway. But uh, like I said, 4 to 6, Eastern Standard, on YouTube. Look up Voluntary Virtues Network. Now, we also enjoy callers. If you want to talk to us, if you have a question, a comment, if you want to tell us we suck, you can call us. The number to call is 347-324-3704. And I, I really don't think anybody's going to tell us we suck, but with, especially with an amazing co-host like Danica. But you never know who's got a bug stuck up their crawl. Yeah, well, there's trolls everywhere. I've dealt with many of them on several occasions. Yeah, so you don't ever know what's going to happen. Please, questions, comments, join in the conversation. Do you want to start a topic? Just let us know. We're easy going. So. You want to start a flame war? Come at me, bro. I'll I'll put you down. Don't take me, bro. <laughs> Come at me, bro. Come at me, bro. Is it bra or bro? I, I always forget. I have no idea. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I do know from before the break, I left everyone in suspense. And I actually, over the weekend, for the first time, uh, met Liberty Phoenix in person. Yay! And he's not here. And if he's listening, then he's going to hear everything we're saying. But it was probably one of the best visits that I've ever had with an individual. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't think you need to go any further to you know, the that. You had a good time. I had a wonderful time. And if he is listening, thank you for making that happen. And I'm glad you're not supposed to say thank you. No, no, no. I'm talking about for the visit in general and hosting me. Hello. Okay. (laughs) No, seriously. That is really what I meant. Thank you. No, no. I I, I know. I've always said thank you to my host as well. It's just, it's a polite thing to do. I know you're a very polite person. You know, unlike what other people tell me that you're not a polite person. So. Somebody told you I wasn't polite? No, I'm, I'm just trying to be funny. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just confused. I was like, seriously? When did I come off that way? Uh, I don't know. Probably when you tried to kill me in zombie games, but, you know, that's all in fun. Oh, that one's fun. I, I can think of the only time I never wanted to be polite to somebody. And, well, we don't need to get into that individual because you don't like that person either. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a couple of issues with said individual was said individual, but he shall remain nameless for the time being. Yeah, we shouldn't name him. But I will say this. um, We have a number of things to talk about that I've posted. You know, it's it's really sad because I found this article. Scottish police investigate referendum fraud after hundreds of uncounted yes votes are found. What? Have you read this at all? No, but I after the failed... Election, I you know didn't really hear anything about it. Cause it was like, oh, okay, and they just went on with their normal lives. But ooh, they tell me more. Um, I think the first thing that ticks me off is the fact that when they reported this, they're like, well, the Scottish people just don't want independence. And um, I, you know, I bought that. I was like, why? And then I read this, and I was like, why did I buy that? Why did I buy that story? Why? So, I read. I came across this article that. Like I said, Scottish police investigate referendum fraud after hundreds of uncounted yes votes are found. It says Scottish police are investigating a case of electoral fraud in last month's independence referendum after a video emerged online today of a man claiming to have found a bag of hundreds, hundreds of voting ballots marked yes in a bin in Glasgow. The man says, surely this is electoral fraud. The man, who calls himself John, son of David, exclaims in a video posted online after claiming he was directed to the bag by an anonymous phone call he had received the night before. 
People that have gone out of their way, they're spending their time going to a voting station and their vote hasn't even been counted. A spokesperson for Scottish police told Newsweek that they've been made aware of the incident and an investigation is underway. Since Scots voted against independence on the 18th of September by a margin of 10%, allegations of electoral fraud have been made from Yes supporters with an online petition requesting a recount already having collected 96,000 signatures. Do you think that they might be up for a, um, for a recount? They might be up for a recount. The question is, are these yes votes ones that were already counted, or were these thrown away before the accounting even happened? That's a good point. That's one point. But two, my second point to that is, if these were votes that had already been counted, don't they have... I mean, I don't know how it works. In America, we don't use paper ballots any longer unless you request it. We use computers, which are illegal. But the thing with these votes, what do you do with these votes? Surely they just don't discard a bunch of votes into the trash can that on such a serious election like this. No, absolutely not. So that that was my first question. And I... I don't know what to think. These people actually might have wanted independence and they weren't granted independence because somebody with an agenda threw out most of the yes votes. Jeez. I really hope that there, I really hope that there's a recount, a, a serious recount at that. And I hope it's by people who are have nothing connect no connections to this situation. These people, if this is what they want, they deserve this. And I can't believe I'm hearing about this in a in another country. It's just it, there's no place in the world anymore that's not corrupt. Yeah, it's very true. And, I mean, it's almost as bad as the you know, Mexico cops where you have to bribe them to make sure that they don't do any hurt to you. That's so sad. This is so – this broke my heart because at first I was like, why in the world would the Scottish people not want independence and come to find out that they did and maybe they're being kept from having it? Yeah, because someone just didn't want it to come true for whatever reason. Whether um, I remember Free Talk Live was doing a uh, segment about this where someone was calling into the show and explaining um, some of the issues the older people had, including his own mother, um, who who was receiving a um, pension from uh, from Britain, and she you know she wanted independence, but she was also worried that if she got independence, what would happen to her income? Because you know she was old, couldn't re- you know, couldn't really work, so that's why she was on said pension, but, you know, that would be, you know, I'm sure, you know, if, if they were in fact granted um, independence that they're, you know, I don't think her money would have stopped coming altogether, but it would have been very in- interesting. And it's certainly a very, um, very valid concern for those that do need that, that some sort of income, like where, where would they get it if Britain stopped being the government? Yeah. And I have a problem with all that too. I mean, we've got the problem going on here in the, in our country. Though. Oh, sure. Definitely. You know, and I, and here I am using the collective again. Some of you might say this is not our country. Um, it's not, you know, I keep saying our government. It is hard for me to get out of that habit and it's not our government. I didn't choose this government. I don't want this government. It's not right. our government. It is the United States government. We just happen to live in the country same time like i said the government in general sounds like there's no there's no good left anywhere <laughs> no it's it's very true i mean there's just there's you know there's corruption and um that's such everywhere i mean i know people this is actually really interesting uh, there i know people especially with COP Block and Free Thought Project, more and more people are becoming aware of police brutality and the authorization of police, um, just the corruption of police overall. And you're going to have, you know, those people that are saying, oh, not all cops are bad, not all cops are doing this. And it's just kind of like, okay, well, if they're not if they're not doing anything bad, you're probably watching them. That's why they're not misbehaving. You, know, you put a camera on them and who knows what they'll be able to do. But a friend of mine posted on her Facebook saying that she was, um, that, being on Facebook made her not want to be a libertarian more so because people were generalizing about police. And I kind of had to think for a little bit. And she thinking, you know what? She is right. I mean, yes, we get into this habit of generalizing this. Oh, all police are bad. Oh, all police are bullies. Well, she's like, okay, yes, the great majority of cops are bullies either all or most of the time. Yes, there are those stories where cops are actually doing good things, like the cop that brought her mother a child booster seat or the ones that actually do their jobs and are and, and are good citizens. 
because I know that, you know, especially here in New Hampshire, there's definitely a lot of, you know, libertarian freedom people that have, you know, made enemies. And these kinds of enemies, you know, do everything they can to warn people of, you know, cities or regions about them. And unfortunately, it's caused them to have kind of a general hate for, you know, for most libertarians. So I was just thinking, she does make a good point that, you know, if we're generalizing about police, then all these people are generalizing about libertarians, which isn't true because only a couple of libertarians are really kind of distasteful people. So, I mean, it kind of made me think for a little bit. I was thinking, all right, you know what? I I don't trust cops. I don't like cops. I don't like what they do this is because I, I feel there's far more evil of them than there are good ones. But she does have a point. We really we should stop generalizing police, and you know, the only way to do that is to record them. And Liberty Phoenix is the master pro at recording. We, when I was at his house, we were going to go um, record cops. There were cops right out in front of his house, and we were going to oh, record geez. them. But by the time that his roommates let him know that there were cops out front, he, they, the cops were almost gone. And he was really bummed out. But you know, I told him, I was like, it, it happens. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, I just, you know, his. I, I noticed his roommates were kind of laughing at him a little bit. They don't get what he does. I get right. what he does, and and I I love the, the fact that he does that. So, just overall, the whole visit was just it was just great. Um, except for the fact that I found out yesterday that while I was out of town, um, my debit card was compromised. <laughs> uh oh, geez, that's horrible. Isn't that terrible? That's Seriously. frightening. I mean, I sound really like, I think it's funny, and it's not funny, but, you know, I, I get this call about fraud, and this lady says, oh, yeah, you know, did you buy something at an optical store? I was like, no, no I don't wear contacts. I don't wear glasses. And she's like, no, wait a minute. She's like, no, no, this is optical, like scopes for guns and stuff. What? And I said, I, I don't shoot guns. I don't own any guns personally. And then she goes, what about this store called Hay Needle at, out in Nebraska? I was like, what is Hay Needle? So I had no idea how my number was confiscated. All I know is that 6.30 in the morning, I'm getting coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, and I think that's it. And then 10 o'clock in the morning, they're going crazy with my debit card. Wow. And it's crazy because... First of all, yes, it's it's technology is kind of scary, but at the same time, it's kind of cool that they're monitoring your account so closely for you and your spending trends and habits. And yes, that is invasive. I get it. But isn't it kind of cool how they can do that and determine that someone's screwing around with your card? That's, you bring up another good point about that. Um, I agree. It, it's definitely got and it's, definitely got, it's kind of frightening. I mean, for one thing, if it's your financial institution, they – aren't kind of obliged that if you have stake in their business, such as your money and things, which you could definitely very easily withdraw and go somewhere else, they kind of have an obligation to tell you, hey, the money that you trusted with us, it's being compromised. We're we're telling you, is this you? If it's not, we can stop it. But if it is, you know, please let us know and, and we'll back off. So when you think about it that way, um, you know, they since you're putting, you know, your money, your stuff into their into their business that they'll protect your money and let it grow they do have a bit of an obligation so in a way you would probably want them to have not you know obviously not access to your account to withdraw it but you know that whole, that opens up a whole new can of worms and you know when you overdraft and they take money from you but since you aren't trusting with their money i mean it's a good thing that they're contacting you and telling you hey you know your money might be going somewhere else and we're not you know we're not sure if this is the this is the right case what do you say about it yeah, and they were quick to determine where the money's come from or where they were spending the money and that it was fraud. Uh, I think the neat thing about it, too, is I called the bank yesterday and reached somebody at the last minute before she left for the day, and she froze my account. So any, oh, good. any purchases that were pending were rejected, and the money was placed back in my account. Now, they're still monitoring my account for the next few days because they said there could have been pending transactions that had not gone through and weren't pending in the system. Um, But the fact that they can do this and then give me credit for it if it happens, it's just nice to know. Yeah, yeah, I I am definitely good on them. Um, I I remember I had a... um, yeah, I had a bank, I had a bank account with another bank. Uh, this was two years ago. Um, I worked at the mall. Uh, it was a job like in between college and stuff like that. And uh, I was going on break, and I asked a bunch of girls if they would like me to go get them coffee. And so all of them handed me their gift cards, 
and they all said, okay, there's only a little bit left on the on the cards, but you know, let me know what the difference is, and I'll I'll pay you back for them. It was it would only be like a few cents, but so I went there, and you know, thankfully it was it was it was like early afternoon during the middle of the week, so, all, so the coffee shop wasn't too horribly busy, so they were able to do this. But I basically did um, three separate did three separate orders, and yes, both girls with gift cards were off by like I want to say a dollar, and the other one was like seventy cents or something like that, and. I didn't carry any cash around me because I had been into direct deposit, so I was just so I hardly ever carried cash, and so I just paid for each of those with my debit card. Um, about 15 minutes later, I got a call back from my bank asking about the two separate transactions, and they asked me if that was me, and I confirmed that it was, and I explained that I was getting coffee for girls at the office, and that uh, um, in order to do that, I had to use my debit card because I didn't have any cash with me. And she thanked me for letting me know that. And she said the reason why they called is because not only were the, you know, was it unusual for me to have two separate transactions of a dollar and a few cents um, each, but that also she said it's sometimes a warning sign because when uh, thieves have your credit card or debit card, usually they will do a couple of test transactions where they'll buy like a pack of gum or you know a couple pieces of candy just to test and make sure that the card itself is correct before they make a very large purchase on it. So I was super appreciative of my bank for looking out for me, even, you know, if it turned out to be uh, a negative thing, because who knows, it very well could have been someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely scary to think about all that. I called uh, Kenny yesterday to tell him, and he was just like, oh, my gosh, really? I'm so sorry to hear that. So uh, I think it's going to be taken care of. People are like, why are you not more upset about this? And I said, really, what are you going to do about it? The the bank is taking care of it. It's doing what it can. You know, they canceled my debit card. I handed mm-hmm. it over to the bank, and they they shredded it for me. So there's not anything you can do. You know, I pulled some cash out to to hold me over, and that's all she wrote. They they monitor it. I get my new card in seven to ten days. Life is fine. You know, that's funny that you say that. Um, you know, most I mean, when I opened up an account at a credit union. They printed my card right then and there. Like I have two credit union accounts because one of them, my mom and I are connected to, uh, and my brother because we, my brother, one of my brothers lives in Japan. So with him having an account at the credit union, my mom can transfer money back and forth very easily. And now that I have an account at that credit union, um, if she needs to give me money or anything, or I need to reimburse her for something, we can just exchange it back and forth. But I also have a separate credit union account for my car because I got it along with my car loan to make automatic payments. But at both of those locations, they printed my card directly there. One of them is like a completely flat card. The other one is your standard card with the bumps on it. So I'm actually surprised that they still told you 7 to 10 days because most banks and financial institutions have the ability to print new cards right then and there. Uh, I think that part of the reason is because I'm using a credit union and it's only got like three branches in the oh. the metro Atlanta area, which I'm not, I know it sounds like an inconvenience, but the fact that credit unions are supposed to be slightly better than banks, like regular mainstream banks, uh, it's, it's good enough for me. That's all I can say for that. Oh, yeah, I definitely endorse credit unions over banks any day. I have worked for banks in the past, and I can tell you that if you have the ability to definitely go with a credit union, and then I, this is, something I think some people would be concerned about because I know I was um, several years ago. But the nice thing about credit unions is that they have this thing called shared branch banking, and you can download a free app for it on your phone where it will allow you to withdraw money or even make any sort of uh, business transactions at a co-op branch. So, for example, you just go there and you need to withdraw money from an account, you need to transfer money over. You can do that at a branch. You can also withdraw money from the ATMs at no um, at no CT because it's through the co-op network, um, and they even have co-op networks all over the, all over the world too because they have to service uh, the military. There is a co-op branch in both Okinawa, Japan, and Tokyo, Japan. So it's it's pretty neat. So if you're worried about that a credit that a credit union is not globalized, like say Citi or J.P. Morgan or Wells Fargo, I mean really you could probably take your credit union card anywhere. And the nice thing about a lot of credit unions is that if you meet certain transactions during the month, they will allow you to have um I want to say like ten or fifteen dollars worth of ATM fees refunded back to you. I know USAA does that too. Like if you um they will give you a credit back up to twelve dollars per month because they understand that Sometimes you need to use an ATM, and there's just not one that has the approved logo on it. So, I, you know, 
PSA for anyone that's looking to switch accounts. <laughs> that is all really interesting to know. I'm I'm kind of wondering now if mine does all that. We'll have to I'll have to check into that. Yeah, for sure. Now I can't live in the city of Atlanta and not talk about Ebola. Oh yes. Ooh, scary Ebola. I mean I'm I mean I guess it's much easier for me to say because I don't live anywhere near it. And I, I you know, I believe I just heard that the man that was carrying it in Dallas um recently passed away, probably from Ebola. But you know, tell me, are you are you worried a little bit? Are you not worried? I mean, what what's your What's your opinion on it? Well, you know, I was telling my kids, or I was telling you about how I'm teaching social studies in my classroom. I taught my children this new word the other day called fear-mongering. Oh, fun. And I was telling them about the fear-mongering because we were look at, learning about the black codes in school versus Jim Crow laws and how it introduced um, segregation to the United States. And I told the kids, I was like, yeah, the black, the black codes started in Louisiana because of fear-mongering. People thought that the blacks were going to kill them in retaliation, and so it was fear-mongering, and they created the black codes. I said fear-mongering allows people to get away with a lot of different things because they get fear and panic infused within everybody in the society, and it causes them to be scared enough to trust the government even more to protect them. And I told the kids this. I was like, in the latest thing, um, you can do research and find out, read more about the uh, NSA. They're they're spying on us and reading all our mail and reading and listening in on our phone calls. And they're like, is that true, Miss Parsons? I was like, guys, if you did a little research and read the news, you would see it, it is. And, you know, it made me sad because my mentor, Brian, who is a friend of mine, we were talking about how I was talking to the kids about that, and he goes, you can't go teaching them conspiracy theories. Oh, man. I said, conspiracy theories? I said, I would understand if I was saying something that was an actual conspiracy theory. But even the NSA has recognized that they're spying on us. Have they not? Yeah, the oh, the NSA has definitely admitted to spying on us, and they've even admitted to um, hacking the Senate's computers. That's okay. not scary. They admit all of this stuff. The Our own government, excuse me, not our government, the government that's in office, and the people, the senators and congressmen who are in office have been trying to pass bills to stop the NSA from spying on us. How is this a conspiracy theory? <laughs> oh, it makes me so irate. Oh, how, yeah, how would that be a conspiracy theory? What, it's all correct. I don't know, but he made me change the subject really quickly because he didn't want to talk about politics. Oh, of course you did. Yeah, and so we did change the subject. But the fact of the matter is that I taught my children the word fear-mongering and explained to them what it was. And I think that this Ebola thing is the same thing. I mean, you have, let's talk about conspiracy theory. You have a patent number saying that our own CDC owns a patent on a strain of the Ebola virus. Who has patents for stuff like this? So, oh, don't you ever you see those patents, like pending patent or patent pending on it? But it's just it's just a bunch of crap, for you know, lack of a better word that I could use for it that I can't say on air. Yeah, but seriously, I mean, I looked it up. It was on Google. Somebody was like, you can't trust Google, but it had the patent number on it for the for the government. The patent was owned by the CDC for a strain of Ebola. Who has a patent on a strain of a disease? Why would you have it? I read something else that said the uh, patent number for the cure for the AIDS virus. Who has these things? Why are they in existence, and how come nobody knows about it? And if they have said patent, why aren't they trying to use it to actually do good for it? That's what I... You know, that's what I'm saying. So the first thought that goes through my mind with all these new cases of Ebola hitting the United States is, is this something that we're injecting into these people or something that we're doing to get them sick? Or are they sick and they just happen to come over here? Yes, my suspicious mind is at work because you know as well as I do in our line of belief systems, you question everything. Absolutely, you question everything. And as we all know, there's there's been you know tons of proven facts that government's really behind a lot of it. You know, now are they behind Ebola? Now I I can't say that for sure, but I mean, where did Ebola come from? Why is it 
coming and, you know, look at what they're doing to try and continue. They're, you know, contaminating people. They're, they're locking them away from everyone. Well, my next thought is, listen to this, now in place. When I was going through the airport last week in Atlanta, Atlanta is one of the few airports that has started a test market where they no longer make you take your shoes off. They no longer make you take your laptops out of the bags. You just shove it in a bucket and you're on your merry way, basically. You get you get scanned, whatever. And I'm not talking about the body scan. I'm talking about just going through the metal detector. And you're on your merry way. Hartsfield is the busiest airport in the world. They don't have the time to keep sitting there and, and taking pictures of all these people and seeing what's wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that airport's huge. It is. It's absolutely huge. So they had to start doing something quicker. But now I'm reading these articles saying that these airports are embracing testing people for Ebola and Ebola-like agents right at the airports. There, wow. there are airports actually doing this. And I read this article on NPR, it's dated today, that says, why one public health expert thinks e- airport Ebola screening won't work. Well, I'll tell you, I went to, um, when I flew into Chicago, I flew into Midway Airport. Or it, the, Chicago has two airports. And when I was flying home, I flew out through O'Hare. Now, O'Hare is, I think, the better well-known Chicago airport. Mm -hmm. And I was going through the line and I noticed that the line I was in was being required to go through the body scanners. And I said to the lady next to me, I said, hey, uh, you know, can I get in your line? I said, I'm sorry. I just, I cannot go through the body scanner. I'm adamantly against it. And she was like, oh, oh, sure, sure. So I get in line, come to find out they start making both lines go through the scanner. Wow. I get up to the guy and I was like, he goes, you're, just step into the scanner. I said, absolutely not. I refuse. He goes, you're going to have to get a pat down. I was like, bring it. So my stuff is going through the x-ray machine. And I said, sir, you know, I, I'm sorry. I know you're busy, but my stuff is right there out in the open and I'm standing right here. And he said, uh, female agent, pat down. Nobody comes. And so I stand there a few more minutes. I'm getting antsy because, I mean, my laptop's out in the open. Everything is sitting there. And I said, sir, my, my stuff. And he's like, ma'am, this is what this is the price you pay when you choose to get pat down. Oh, my God. And I said, I understand that, sir, but this is my stuff, and I'm very worried about my stuff. He's like, female, pat down. And a few minutes go by. I was like, sir. He's like, female, pat down now. He's like, I, totally undermining you. I was annoying him is the thing. And I thought it was hilarious. So I finally get pat down. This lady's like, okay, ma'am, this is what I'm doing with my hand. I'm going to run it around your waist. I'm going to put my hands under your breasts. And she's doing this, and I'm just, I start moaning. <laughs> I start moaning like I'm enjoying it. And she she looks kind of disgusted. And I told her afterwards, I said, you know, if this TSA thing doesn't work out for you, you'd have a great job as an escort. Oh, man, you did not. I sure did. And she gave me the dirtiest look, and I went on my merry way. <laughs> so I get my digs in, and I tell I tell Ken, I say, yeah, I think next time I'm going to drive up. And he starts laughing, and he's like, well, you can't get so much of the TSA, huh? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, 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 I love having fun with them. They're fun to mess with. No, I think it's just I'm going to have more freedom because he's going to work while I'm up there. And if I want to get out and about, I want to have a vehicle. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. How long will the drive be? 11 hours. Oh, that's too bad. See, you said the same thing I did. I said, it's just 11 hours. He he laughed and went 11, just 11 hours. I was like, well, my dad was 15 to 20 hours, and I do that drive. Okay, I drove 2,600 miles, you know, taking some very long days across the country. 11 hours is nothing. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. So... Yeah, I'm going to drive, and my brother lives four hours south of him, so I'm going to spend the night with my brother and finish the drive the next day. But let's go back to this Ebola story, because you and I have the tendency to be able to successfully get off on the most amazing tangents. I know, and I, and I freaking love it. <laughs> I love it, too. We're great. Um, so we're talking about airport Ebola screenings, and so apparently the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And i got to say, the reason also that this hits home is not just the airport, but the Center for Disease Control is about 45 minutes from my house. Oh, wow. So I live really, really close 
to everything. And it says that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director, Tom Frieden, has said his organization will soon be implementing new health screening procedures at U.S. airports. It's part of an ongoing effort to control the spread of Ebola. This is why I, I questioned this. I questioned this big time because I said to myself, was the whole point of this to get more screenings at airports and further enclose and encapsulate the people in the United States to keep them here. Wow. When I have big thoughts, they're really big thoughts. And I just can't see them doing this at the airport. There's a, there's an agenda attached to this somewhere. Well, first it was 9-11 and now it's Ebola. I mean, I guess, you know, they get to try out everything now, huh? I just, yeah, call me a conspiracy theorist, like I said. You say I'm crazy, I don't care. But you have to look between the lines. I just cannot see this being just a safety precaution. But sorry, uh, my, my cat was moving around my keyboard. She messed some things up. I, you know, it's just, it's really, really hard because I you know, want to, you know, I want to believe that, you know, uh, a government would not be trying to subject to this kind of thing to keep its citizens in mind. But I mean, with everything that's been going on with all those stories, I mean, it's just, it's kind of hard to not be legitimately concerned about this. I am alarmed just like you. It is, scary to think that they are trying to hurt us. And if people are listening out there who don't believe us, well, fine, don't believe us. But they're certainly not out to do us any good. So let's keep, let's look in more into this article. Um, he said, we'll be strengthening our screening procedures, both at the source and, and at the entry. Okay, so basically in that sentence I read, People are opting out of the body scanning procedure, so we want to make sure that we can humiliate them and embarrass them in different ways at the airport. Yep. You know, then they're going to be scanned for the for that freaking virus. It says, what will these screenings entail, and will they make Americans safer? It's difficult to say because the CDC hasn't released many details yet. Larry Gostin, a professor of global health law at Georgetown University, says that the new requirements will likely mirror procedures already used in some West African airports, travel history, looking for signs for illness, and a temperature reading. And he said that this is not for these reasons. He said that these fever screenings can be unobtrusive, but there's no tried and true method that will keep Ebola out of the United States. Um, Ebola patient Thomas Eric Duncan, who traveled to the U.S. from Liberia, is in critical condition in a Dallas hospital. Uh, he would not have any detected he would not have been detected either in Africa or the U.S. because he was not exhibiting any signs of the virus. So, I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? They couldn't have found it because he didn't have it yet. Well, no, I mean, once they, once they are in proximity of the virus, it does it does take a few days for the for said symptoms to show up. That, and there was another flight where the flight attendants started passing out Tylenol to everybody and said, here, take this just in case. Did he refuse? No, that guy didn't. This was a different situation. Uh -huh. um, I think it was in the case of SARS. It says in the 2003 SARS outbreak, um, people were not being, people were not having it, the symptoms, but then they ended up having SARS. Um, this person, let's see, oh, people know how to game the system. During the SARS outbreak, Gostin was on a flight to Beijing when the airline flight attendants began to hand out Tylenol to first-class passengers and encouraged them to take the medicine to be sure they passed fever screenings. Wow. This is really, really a shaky system. Wow. Totally They're, shaky system. Are they, re, are they really infecting everybody with the virus? I have no idea, but I will tell you this. We're going to go ahead and we're going to take another commercial break. And when we come back, we should have uh, Ken, the Liberty Phoenix Ottinger, on with us. I'm very excited about that. So uh, let me find out. What, what should we play? Let's play some. Um, let's try to. Uh, we're not lab rats. What a fitting commercial. Okay. So everybody, we are not lab rats. And here's the commercial. And we'll be back right after these messages. Yay. I'm not a lab rat. I'm not a lab rat. My family is not a bunch of lab rats. I am not a lab rat. 
Thanks, but no thanks. 80% of the processed food in America has been genetically modified. That's GMOs. That's GMOs. You can't even tell what foods contain GMOs at the grocery store. Because no GMO food labels are required. That makes us the guinea pigs. Hmm, sounds like an experiment to me. GMOs are scary. It's up to you. You're an adult. You can vote. I can't vote because I'm a kid. Vote yes. Vote yes. Please vote yes. Can't I cook you? Freedomizers, you have a voice. How will you vote when initiatives are added to the ballot in your state? Hello, everyone. Proof is here. I want to let you know about our latest promotion on our freedomizerradio.com website. Our chat client, Bark, B-A-R-C.com, is hosting a micro-Bitcoin giveaway while supplies last. All you have to do is go to freedomizerradio.com, join our chat room, create a screen name, and type to your friends. And some micro-bitcoins will fall from the sky. Not only that, the more people that are typing, there will be some random lotteries as well. So just for typing to your friends, you can earn some micro-bitcoins. So who knows how long this will last, but join us now, freedomizerradio.com. and I'm with GMO Free Vegas. So what are we going to do about this now? Well, to begin with, we advocate the labeling of genetically engineered food or foods with GMOs. Regardless of how you feel about the GMO issue, we can agree that we should at least have a choice of being informed about what we put into our bodies. We won't have a choice until these foods are properly labeled. We must remember who we are fighting in this battle. We are fighting corporations selling us poison, backed by corporations making us poison. And these corporations will only respond to one kind of vote, the vote that we make with our dollars. Recently, Yoplait faced so much criticism over high fructose corn syrup that they removed it from all of their yogurts. Right before and after the march against Monsanto in May, we saw major corporations like Whole Foods, Target, and Chipotle make major announcements about deciding to label and or phase out GMOs. This is happening because of us, because we will solve this as making demands as consumers first. Starting right now, we're going to boycott corn. This is all you have to do, is don't buy corn. Corn on the cob, corn in a can, corn in a mix at a restaurant, any visible kernels of corn. All we are asking for people to do right now is to boycott corn. This is going to be a clear, completely simple message that will definitely get back to its makers. We won't stand for poison. We won't stand for cronyism, and that is why we march against Monsanto. And we're back. That was such a fantastic commercial break. Just everybody remember to boycott corn. It changed my life. Corn's bad, okay? <laughs> so we we are totally against corn, yes. Um, anyway, okay, so over the commercial break, we gained the marvelous, the fantastic, the magnificent, Liberty Phoenix is here with us. I'm so happy. Yay! Yep. Hey, hey, hey. Always add something to the show. So, first of all, I got to say, did we figure out what was wrong with the sound equipment? No. Uh, <laughs> I that it's broken. I'm going to take them both over to the local car shop when I get some time and uh, see if I can't figure it out. Hopefully, it's the mic or the cable because those are under warranty still and I can just return it there. But if it's the mixer, and that's still under warranty, but I'll have to ship it back to Georgia first. Oh, no. Um, well, you know, the person who gave it to us. the baby. <laughs> <laughs> the person. The bingo, wait your baby. No, I was calling that as coin dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. I'm not the baby. Yeah. Yeah. And as we know, that person who sent it to you is here in Georgia and is about an hour from me. So uh, we know all about that. Sure do. Um, so we will get it fixed. I guess that means that our wonderful podcast is going to be on hiatus for a tiny bit. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm going to give him a chance to plug it. Plug it, plug it, plug it. Well, you can check out the Broken and Busted Down Unity Evolved 
at, uh, on SoundCloud. You can find us there. You can also find us on iTunes. It's basically, it would be a, the original inception was Anarchy Meets Zeitgeist. Um, but it's kind of evolved as the name states, and it's become more of a, uh, a melting pot. Um, you know, we'll, we'll cover different news stories, and then we'll have a, you know, a guest. Uh, we've had a few notable ones. We've had Mark Stevens from the No State Project. Um, he's also the author of Adventures in Legal Land. Um, we've also had Adam Kokesh on, and it's a, it's a really great show. It's fun. Now, the really cool thing about Adam Kokesh, and I have to throw this in, because that was that was like a crowning moment for our quote-unquote little podcast. I love them name-dropping Right. While he was while he was broadcasting on our show, he was simultaneously broadcasting our show on his show. Wow. So it was really a cool experience and just the fact that he actually paid us attention and gave us the time of day was absolutely amazing. Adam Kokesh is the man, actually. I I I I like Adam Kokesh a lot. He's a really, really cool guy. He's nice too. Yeah, he's super nice. For all of like the political dissent that he creates, he is a genuinely nice guy. Yes, that's very, yeah, very. Adam nice Kokesh goes. He's uh, his, he just recently released his book Freedom uh, on hard copy, and he's selling copies of them at one hundred and thirty dollars for a hundred copies. I'm trying to raise money right now. I've got about eighty bucks um, that I can contribute to it. But if you want to donate to that, the uh, the Freedom Book Fund. Um, you can go to Unity Evolved and donate in Bitcoin. Uh, totally help us out. That'd be great. Are you, spread the word of freedom. Are we only taking Bitcoin? On the website, yes. So, like, when I came up to see you this past weekend, I could have handed you some cash towards the goal? Yeah, if I had accepted it. You, you didn't even mention accepted. it. Uh, if I had, like, fully formed that idea by then. It yeah. came to me about a day or two ago. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I'm going to have to give it next month then when I come up. Oh, no. So, oh, no. Yes, are you actually pay- are you actually paying to see him? <laughs> no, just donating <laughs> to the cause, Janica the Great. What are you inciting? Okay, okay, okay. okay. You're inciting, but what are you insinuating as well? La, 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 la. Yeah, yeah, shush. Anyway. Is it the same, con- same consent? Doesn't need cash. That's all. <laughs> um. Well, you know, I'm a terrible person. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anywho. Okay, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Oh no, sad Trump. <laughs> yes. Oh. I always knew it was never boring when he gets on the show with us. Never. So anyway, anyway, so. Uh, we were talking earlier, Danik and I, about how. In my class, I was teaching my students about how it was wrong for people to get mad at President Andrew Johnson for taking back the land that was given to the black people after the Civil War because it was stolen from people who used to own those black people. And I mentioned how everybody called him a horrible man because he he confiscated the land back and gave it back to the original landowners from before the war, which Mm -hmm. would have been the slave owners. And... The kids were like, well, that was, it was wrong. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why? And they're like, well, because they didn't have anything. They were set free and then they didn't have anything. So he, you know, he took away the land that they were given. I said, but is it really theirs if it was stolen from somebody and they gave it to the black people that it, they stole it from the plantation owners? Well, the plantation owners, as far as I'm concerned, um, got it under immoral means as well. Didn't most of the uh, most of the land in this country was stolen from people that lived here before us? You're absolutely so right. Who actually has a claim on the land is uh, whoever can defend it the best. I don't disagree, and with any of that, but sticking to the point I was trying to make in my class was the whole point was you can't say that just because people do bad things that if they worked for something, they deserve to have it taken away from them and given to somebody else just because they did bad things. And I was looking at your page today on Facebook and noticed something you posted. It was a cop car. I can't tell you the number of cop cars I've seen going around that are like Cadillacs or Corvettes, and they say this was purchased with money confiscated from a drug raid. And it says just because these people did bad things, it doesn't mean that they have the right to 
take the money themselves and use well, it. Selling drugs a bad thing. Um, I mean, in in accordance to the meme that I read, and in accordance to what society believes, not all of society, just some of society, um, then drugs are a bad thing. And especially according to the meme, and it, it said, you know, so it's okay that just because the money was was. Um, well, the second half of the meme, you know, it, it, the the it's a picture of the truck. It says this used to be a drug dealer's car, and now it's ours. Um, in the bottom of the meme, of course, it says something insightful, and it says because theft is perfectly fine as long as we steal it from those people we judge lesser than us. And that's pretty much how it is. If you're a drug dealer, if you break some of these uh, these so-called laws that everybody you know worships, like they're the edicts from God, that uh, you are how somehow a bad person because you know if. Uh, if you were a, a landowner back in you know 1830s and you were black, that was breaking the law, which means you were wrong. Yeah, and but see, that's what I'm trying to say. It, it's the same thing. You know, the plantation owners had this land, and they they weren't the ones looking down. The black people were looking down. It just reminded me of of what was going on when I taught my kids. At the end of the lesson, basically, what I said was. You know, pretend that you bought a $700 video game system and your friend just comes and takes it from you and gives it to someone else that has less than you. What are you going to say? And a kid tells me, I see where you're going with this. And I said, okay, so was it wrong for Andrew Johnson to give the land back to the people it originally belonged to if it was stolen from them by the government? And they're like, well, no. It, it, it wasn't wrong. And I was like, that's the point I'm trying to make. Now, in the terms that you used, Ken, yes, you are correct. The land shouldn't belong to really anybody. But in just reference to this lesson, that's what my kids and I talked about the other day. Well, not that it shouldn't belong to anybody. That it's, I mean, property only really belongs to they, them, those who can defend it, whether it's from the state or from a private party. True true and i do have to say before i let you hijack the show and talk about the articles you wanted to mention (laughs) um there is an article that i read it's about a woman in oklahoma city she's a panhandler she is an elderly woman and according to this article she was caught on video getting into a brand new car i did see that video yeah i heard about that well, I'll tell you this. This this really makes me think about giving money to anybody who's standing on the side of the of the road. I drive through the the downtown, the heart of Atlanta, every single morning on the way to work. And there's this curve. They call it the Grady Curve because it's right next to uh, Grady Memorial Hospital. And there's always this is morning rush hour traffic, and there's always some person standing on the side of the road trying to get money from people. In rush hour, it is probably potentially one of the worst places to stand, but I'm always like rolling up my window and not paying them any attention. I don't know what they would do with the money. I don't know who they are, and I sure as heck don't trust anybody who's willing to stand in rush hour traffic to panhandle. So this article just made me think even more about where is the money going? This woman's panhandling, but she has a brand new vehicle. But yeah, yeah, there's, Tons of stories where you know um, panhandlers such as that do sit for several hours a day, only to walk away and go back to their you know cushy hotel or their nice house with their nice car. Like there's you know been tons and tons of proof that these panhandlers really are wealthy people. They're just purposely dressing up in ratty attire to try and get pity from passersby, and it's just it's absolutely despicable. But, you know, if you're genuinely concerned about someone that they may actually need help, and but you're not sure, you know, you don't know how to get the money away, um, the best thing that you can do really is to go to, you know, a some sort of restaurant, you know, Applebee's, McDonald's, whatever you feel like, buy a meal, and then go back and hand it to them. That way you know your money went to providing someone a hot meal. And you know what? Maybe they are frauds. Maybe they really are pretty well off and they're posing. But, you know, at least you can know that, hey, at least I I purchased someone 
food so that they don't go hungry. Well, I don't like the idea that somebody necessarily has to be impersonating someone that's poor. I mean, more power to her. Sure, if she can make money off of it, cool. Anarchy. Hey, sure. If they, if they want to make money off of it, I don't it, see it still... as being an immoral act. I mean, unless she's sitting there holding a sign that says, I'm super broke and I can, I'm eating cat food and, and so forth. Um, if she's committing fraud, then there's a problem. But if there's just a guy sitting there saying, hey, give me, can I get some money? And he's sitting there making, you know, $150, $200 a day doing it. I don't see a problem with it. Well, well she, I, she has well, some right. kind of you sign in her hand. That's the only right. thing. Right, and you don't have to get, you don't have to give them money. I totally understand. They're not holding you a gun or knife point, you know, demanding that you get the money. Absolutely not. They're free to do that. You're free to give the money if you want. I'm saying that I would, I personally would have a problem with it if they are not really in need. And, but, I mean, again, Freedom of Association, if you don't feel right about it, don't give them their money. Exactly, and the way uh, the way that video ended was appalling. The guy's sitting there, uh, you know, chewing this woman out, and the last thing he does is threaten her property. He says, "If I see us here again, I'm going to break your window." It's like, dude, that's not your property. I don't care if you're upset that you feel duped. Uh, that doesn't give you, you know, the right. the right to destroy her property or impose violence on her. We, you know, we are all in agreement on that. We are totally all in agreement on that. Hey, get it while you can. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he, I just, he, just I wants to reason, he just wants to reason to use all the nifty noises on his mixer or his, I, his soundboard, I should say. Well, I don't think that, you know, I don't think some person should be threatened with violence or anything like that. I think they're a very, they're a terrible person for doing that and, you know, potentially hurting someone that could benefit money. But again, I don't, you know, I don't think the person that's, uh, you know, trying to, you know, take money from people that are donating should necessarily be arrested. Absolutely not. They should probably be mocked and made fun of, you know, but not necessarily like given any sort of, um, you know, physical harm, verbal harm or anything like that, but they really should not be doing that. But, you know, that's just me. Well, I will tell you, like I said, never a dull moment when Liberty Phoenix is on the show with us and he had a few things he wanted to discuss. So, um, I'm going to back off and let him hijack, and we're going to chime in with his brilliant thoughts. So what's going on in your world, sir? So I have no clue where this, where I got the idea from or wh- who introduced me to this. Uh, but this is an idea that's in beta. Uh, it hasn't been released yet. Um, there's a few concepts, videos of it actually being used, so I do believe that it exists physically. You can actually touch it, um, but the prototypes, it is a... a a camera that fits around your your wrist like a uh, like a nice wristwatch or whatnot. Um, probably a little bit bigger than a wristwatch, but it's a camera that can come off and fly and stay in proximity of you and just record you. And you don't have to sit there and hold it. You, it frees up your hands while you're recording, so that you don't have to. Uh, so that if you need to. I don't know, defend yourself, or if you're making a video of you doing parkour, uh, you don't have to have somebody standing at some crazy angle, or some of the videos that they have is this woman, uh, she's uh, she's rock climbing, and she's hanging out to the rock, and she just kind of tosses it out, and uh, just hovers there, and when she wants it, I guess they have some type of a device that brings it back. Uh, but it's a really amazing idea. It's, it's a little quadcopter, and the four... Uh, the four uh, the four arms fold up, and it kind of looks... If you guys ever seen Ben 10, the little thing that he's got on his arm, the little alien thing or whatever that turns him into stuff, I don't know, he watched too much. <laughs> uh, no, that, that, it doesn't sound familiar to me. <laughs> well, it's 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 like a, you know, a little... Uh, it's like a bangle, just that size. And okay. It's, it's really cool. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be different ideas and different... Um, ways that you can implement that technology of a flying camera that stays in proximity of you to where it can't it wouldn't only be a wristwatch i'm sure you can make a hat out of it or something like that but. well i thought we were trying to prevent the uses of drones say again i said i thought we were trying to prevent the uses of drones <laughs> uh governmental use of drones absolutely <laughs> private uses whatever i know i i was you know, just messing with you um Speaking of cameras, I know that the, some of the actors here in New Hampshire have been using this, uh, like, a camera on a watch. 
it records video it records video as well as records sound. Now I've seen the video and the video itself like could definitely use a little bit of improvement. Like it's great for what it is, don't get me wrong, but you know, there's always room for improvement. But it's great because it catches audio extremely well and you know, who is going to expect that there's going to be something on your watch? I mean it's totally it's totally James Bond and spy movies that no one would suspect because who would suspect you, you know, wearing a watch? Yeah, because wearing a watch is very fishy. But depending on the state, you could be prosecuted for wiretapping. Well, that's only that's only if you're in your private areas. It's perfect if you're out in the public and you don't want someone to know that you're that you're quite there in public. You know, then that's fine. But you're absolutely right. There are there could be potentials for wiretapping if you're doing it. In a pri- in a private place. So as long even as you're outside, public. even eh. in public, there's some states that are you know two party consent in public. I mean, uh, the government state, doesn't care what's right. Can you tell me what state that would be? Because I you know I am under I was always told that outside in public is considered like public and not any sort of private. I could just be talking out the side of my neck. Atlanta or not Atlanta, but the state of Georgia is a one party. Consent. So just as long as I know I'm recording, then that's all that matters. Yeah, New Hampshire is dual party. There are some that are single party. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is that there was actually a discussion on Free Talk Live uh, because someone was upset for uh, for filming for filming and taking pictures of kids at a um, at a state park. It was some sort of like festival that was out in public, and they're saying you can't. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I got my story mixed up. Um, basically, there was a man that uh, Derek Jay was on, about to go on trial, and he was recording his trip going to the um, courthouse. He was on one of the streets here in, private, in public property. Someone comes up and starts antagonizing him. Then another woman with the lady comes up and says, oh, you can't tell my child. It's illegal. Well, the woman you know, walks up to him out of her own will, puts the, you know, puts the baby in plain view of the camera. She's like, you can't record my kid. So there was a bunch of controversy about that. And it's like, no, you can, you know, it's not their fault that they're out in public playing on parks or whatever. You know, photographers are always going to be out there taking pictures for magazines or articles, showing people playing. You know, unfortunately, if you're out in public, you should have no expectation of privacy. So if you're out in public, you know, do expect to be recorded in some way, either through a photograph or through some sort of audio recording. There is no, you know, state legaliz- illegalization of that. Well, then, thank you for correcting me. I'm sure some there's some prosecutor that would try it though. Oh, you know, I'm sure you know, I'm sure the people that are you know that are worried certainly of like you know pedophiles or things watching or taking pictures of their children. Certainly, I mean, there's always going to be those kinds of sickos around, but it helps us because if we're out in public and we get bullied by police or any other individuals and we want to record them, well, we can record them through this watch. And if they try and come after us and say, "Oh, you're not allowed to record," it's like, well. No, I, I am allowed to record. I'm out in public, and you know you have no sense of privacy. If you don't like it, go to your own home where you don't. Ha- where if someone does try to record you in your home, you can certainly pursue legal action. I seem to remember some vague story recently of a, an individual that was caught upskirting photo or taking upskirt photos, and he wasn't. He was uh, he was let off because they said it was within his uh, within his rights to take photos of people upskirt. I can't remember where it was at. Have you guys heard of that? Um, I remember a, an article about, but, but this one's a different thing because this one's in private property. Uh, a gynecologist was taking pictures of women's nether regions um, and using them for, you know, his own uses. It was for medical reasons, okay? Quote, unquote, medical reasons. It was medical reasons, Danica, and don't you forget it. Medical reasons. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to upset your gynecologist. Hey. <laughs> medical medical reasons. Medical. M- medical reasons. Yes, medical. Oh, maybe it was magical reasons. I don't know if it's magical reasons or medical. Okay, never mind. But anyway, onward. But yes, um, about what you were saying about the recording device, um, I think hey, that's an awesome idea that they're able to have it fly out of, you know, fly out of the reach and still be able to record where your hand's free you know, either defending yourself or doing some sort of crazy awesome parkour moves. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. I mean, the, it's called the Nixie. You can check it out at flynixie.com. Uh, it's got a uh, a team of about eight nine people. Um, the inventor Christopher Kostal, he's the uh, he's a, he has a PhD in experimental physics 
physics, and he has a post and he does postdoctoral research at Stanford. Um, there's like six or seven major PhDs on here. Um, the I believe it's supposed to. I don't think the website says has a date when it's going to be released. Um, but you can sign up for their uh, their little newsletter um, at their website and uh, check out a couple of videos. It's really cool. It's it's going to make accountability, especially police accountability, um, a lot easier. Oh yeah, for sure. Because no longer will the police be able to say, "Hey, I think your phone is a is a gun." What are you talking about, officer? Yes, my phone is totally a gun. Actually, my phone would be more like a bird, and I can bail you over the head with it. But <laughs> yeah, well, that's a drone. I don't know if it has guns on it. You can attack me with it. Oh, geez, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to think of UFOs just flying over, pew pewing at me. I think that I'm going to lovely moment for just a minute to face palm while I read something that my mother posted on her Facebook page. Oh no. It's a picture of the American flag and it says, Share if you agree the US flag should never be banned from an American classroom for America. The I don't even make my students stand up and say the pledge. You should tell your mom, Mom, I can't even with you. You know what I should do? I should probably find that article that said why we started selling more flags. Oh, my God. Yes, do it, do it, do it. Yeah, that the we only started saying a pledge so that we could sell more flags and that the original salute to the flag was the same one they saluted Hitler with. Hey, Charlie Chaplin had the same kind of mustache that Hitler had, too. Is he got and, we all, and we all know why no one has that kind of mustache anymore. Plus, mustaches are gross. Um, I, I've told her this before. They're rugged. I told her this before. I told her the story about this, and she's like, yeah, but I think it's one of those things that it's okay because, I mean, it's just a flag. And I'm like, no, no. Uh, oh. So, yeah. Okay. Your, your mom makes me sad. She makes my head hurt and my face hurt. I'm posting this article. I just posted it in response to it. So I probably just created a uh, an S storm, but whatever. I've created the S storm. Let it bring it. Let's do this. So anyway. Well, hey, there's always the unfollow button. They can unfriend you on Facebook. My mother and unfriending me, that's a riot. She'll stay my friend just to watch what I'm doing. Wait, wait, wait. Did she seriously unfriend, unfriend you? Facebook. It's not real unless it's on Facebook. Uh, yeah, exactly. What did you say, Danica? Um, well, I was just going to say, did your mom seriously uh, try to, did your mom seriously um, unfriend you? No, 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 no. She won't unfriend me is what I'm saying. She'll stay my, oh, friend. Oh. She'll stay my friend just to spite me if she if she wants to, honestly. So. Oh, that's, that's that's very funny. Yeah. So, anyway, what else is on the agenda tonight as far as news from around the world? Well, did you guys hear about the uh, the recent economy news? Uh oh. No. Uh, apparently, Mr. Ken Shorjan from the Daily dot com. He was on Angel Clark's show today, and he had a, a nice little story about the IMF releasing their new uh, classifications for the top ten, fifteen, twenty. Uh, Economies in the world, whatever it was, I'm not sure, but he said that the <laughs> the United States is no longer the number one economy in the world. Sorry, guys, America is done as being number one. Pew, pew, pew. Not pew. Say that America. At all anymore. America. We're number one. No, no, actually, you're not number one in anything at all anymore because China has now been classified as the the, uh, the the strongest economy by the IMF and um, being the strongest economy in the world that kind of uh, comes with a couple of perks um, you know what what happened after in, a, in the mid 40s when um, the United States was decided to be after World War II the strongest economy they kind of had this thing going on where they were considered the world's reserve currency where everybody had to use that to buy different goods. Well, yeah, if uh, if the yuan gets put in as the world reserve currency, I think that would be pretty much the final co- the final nail in the American coffin. If that doesn't wake enough people up when uh, when everything tanks, 
in a couple of years here, there's going to be a lot of people that are that are screwed. Well, I do say this. America does have the number one economy. If you are sticking up the middle finger, it's the number one. <laughs> yeah, no shit. So that's, that's my take on that. And, um, yeah, America. America. I, mean, it, I guess it would just really depends on, you know, your view, depending on where you rank and how much money you have, really. Well, I'm just saying that when, you know, having that status as being the world's, you know, strongest economy, that's going to force the OPEC nations to probably adopt that as the, the reserve currency. It's no, yeah. That's the progression. Oh, yeah. And, hey, we can print out money while we're at it. Yeah. And it'll just get worth less and less and less. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you just just feel all that money crinking out, and then inflation is just going to go up, and then now more seats are going to pass you know, higher minimum wages, and then benefits are going to go Oh, it's just it's going to be a fantastic thing. You know, it's a good thing that they're printing all this because we're going to use T. We're going to need to use uh, TP. We have to use something. I prefer dollars than leaves. <laughs> well, well, I I can't believe you guys are speaking so negatively about my country. I I'm so sad. I just want to cry. I I just I just love my country. I know. I'm sure I sound a little unpatriotic, but you know what? You know what's patriotic? Not paying taxes. I just, I can't believe you just said that. I just, I want to cry. I just, I just love my country. But, 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 but Mandy, don't you remember like years and years ago when the British were trying to tax us and we said no because we don't want to pay their taxes and we dumped all their tea into the water? Yeah, you know what? Those were the days. They sure have switched times, haven't they? Yeah, it looks at all that wonderful tea. I wonder I wonder what that whole area of water would taste tasted like. Probably really gross because water was probably gross, but maybe not considering it probably wouldn't have been polluted. And this a mix of burl gray and fish poop. And mm-hmm. see, this is those those beautiful tangents that we get off on that we are so good at. <laughs> I love it. And I love it when Liberty Phoenix comes in because he, he brings some stuff and then we all have like very smart alecky things to throw in and it's just it's just awesome. We have good chemistry here guys. I think I think Glenn Beck Glenn Beck is my new hero. Glenn Beck <laughs> uh both my mom and my sister love Glenn Beck and I'm like, why? Because he's a libertarian. What? You know, Glenn Beck was an important part of my evolution. I remember when I first started waking up I'd come home after work pretty much every single day and watch one of the three Light Guys movies. And if it wasn't that, I'd be sitting there taking a nap on the couch watching Glenn Beck. And he was the, the, what was it, the Poe of getting into the uh, the Liberty Movement. I don't know if you guys have seen The Hangover. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the soft, milky rice stuff that you can feed to babies and old people because it's nice and easy. You know, he kind of slides you in, you know, he's, he's, he's before, cause when you're a true anarchist, I mean, it's rough waters living life, you know, it's, it's, it's choppy. It is hurricanes from hell. Okay. But with Glenn Beck, it's just a nice little, you're just kind of coasting down the river and it's starting to you like, you know, maybe a mile down there's some rapids. That's, that's the Glenn Beck entrance. Well, he claims to be a libertarian. And, uh, you know, Ben Bernanke claims not to be Satan. What's your point? <laughs> that he claims to be a libertarian. That's why Danica was like, what? what? Yeah, no, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I, haven't, I love Colbert. I think he's a very funny guy. I've read his backstory. Um, has some really neat things to share. I know he's not, I know he's, kind of a liberal guy and that's fine because I'm so you know what I don't have to believe anything that he says about as far as political stances I just like him for his comedic mix because he's very very funny that and they were talking about the pumpkin fest on it which was great because they were trying to be like yeah this small little town says they need to have a bear cat to uh, ward off you know disruptive people it's like really dude really oh 
Yeah, I don't. Because, you know, centralized governments need more toys. That's totally what they need. They, yeah, they're not going to use it. I, I guarantee you, they're not going to use it. No, 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 no. Not unless you really need some saving. Watch out. The government's on its way. We're going to help the shit out of you. We're yeah, going to hey, help hey. you whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, then you're just going to get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> the government helps people all the time, and uh, and they even help you when you don't want them to help you. And when you try to help yourself, they stop you from helping yourself. There's a story out of London. I don't have it in front of me, um, but there was apparently a uh, a community that wanted some speed bumps put in their put in their their neighborhood in this 60 meter patch of of a road, and they went to the to the city, and the city was like, "Well, I'm sorry, that's not our responsibility." So they said, "Okay, fine." Well, there was a wealthy guy that lived down the street. He's like, "Okay, well, I'll get somebody, and I'll put the shit in." It cost him like six grand to put it in. Well, the city comes back and says, "Hey, you don't have authority to put to put that stuff in there. That's going to get taken out, and you guys are going to get fined." So they ripped up their six thousand uh, dollar their six thousand dollar speed bumps and fined them. Oh sure, yeah. So of course it's they not would. their responsibility when you when they want you to fix the roads, but they sure as hell. But it is their authority to tell you what you can, what you can and cannot do with your roads. But my roads, dude, my roads. Who's going to build the roads? But who will build the roads? Oh, my favorite, my favorite thing to do at Porkfest was to drive really slow on those small campground roads. And people were walking by. I'd be like, get off my roads. And they'd be like, not your roads, my roads. Yeah, for those who don't know, my roads is like this like, recurring thing for uh, the trains. It's very funny. I guess you had to be there. <laughs> what, yeah. Yeah. Been, uh, what was the owner's name? Oh, what was the guy? Ernie Hancock had him on the show. What was his name? Oh, who didn't Ernie have on his show? <laughs> Sorry, um, I love, love, love you, Ernie, but I just, I, you know, I can't keep track of who's got on the show. Very true. Well, it's the the owner of the of the entire campground. What was it? There's like a one word name. Oh, um, goodness. All I know is that they ban- is that they banned Christopher Campbell from ever going to uh to vo- to that campground. Yeah, I doubt that'll stick. That'll get lifted, I'm sure. Uh, well, Christopher Campbell okay. being cried across the street from Ian. <laughs> well, he wasn't there this past pork fest, so only to, only through a Skype call, which is hilarious. And uh, I'm just saying they 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 can't keep him out forever. <laughs> I know, and I, and I, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. Um, we'll just. Uh, Although I have, I have, I have heard scuttlebutt that it might be moved from Rogers because of all the issues with sanitation and such. Yeah, um, I don't know. There was, there was definitely talk about that. Um, some people just said, you know what? There's really no other place we can have it but Rogers because just of the sheer size and the fact that they don't really care what goes on there. And as you and I both know, some stuff can get pretty wild there. Um, but I mean, you're right. I mean, I was not happy at all with how they were running the plantation and the fact that they were barring up the bathroom for days on end and that you had to drive into town to try and get any sorts of, um, you know, proper uh, discourse going. So I don't know. I I I've definitely heard that too. Well, I guess we'll have to see when the time gets closer. But right now, I'm excited about Liberty Forum because it's not camping. It's in a nice hotel, and I get to dress well, up. No, honestly, Yay. it's the top of a mountain. You can use the trees. Well, honestly, honestly, she's excited about Liberty Forum because she lives close oh. enough to go to Liberty Forum. You gotta you gotta rough it. She lives close enough to go to Liberty Forum, you know, and not pay a, a ton for transportation costs. Yeah, I still have to, still have to drive through that crazy snow and still have to pay for gas. But yeah, I do live closer, which is totally awesome. And I have every intention of being at Pork Fest 2015. Good. We're going to have so much fun. And I'm when going is, to... When uh, Liberty Forum 2014 started? 
Uh, let me grab my calendar real quick. We are going to be looking at, uh, it's going to be a little bit later this year. It is going to be, da, 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 uh, March 5th through the 8th, yes. And that is basically the winter version of Porkfest, correct? Pretty much. Um, except that you dress up fairly nicely, and it's in a nice hotel. And then there's running water and bathrooms. That's too much amenities. <laughs> he, he wants to rough it. You got to be out in the cold in the winter, man. You got you to gotta go camping. I imagine yeah. that's going to make the, the cost of going there a lot higher. I'm, I'm sure Liberty Forum costs a lot more than Pork Fest. Uh, Liberty Forum uh, is definitely pricier than that uh, than Pork Fest, definitely. And, uh, you know, obviously you have to factor in hotels. But the nice thing about hotels is that you can probably, you know, lessen the cost by, um, you know, grouping up with another Liberty person. But then you might have to deal with, like, cuddling and stuff. And that's just and that's when it gets weird, right? <laughs> well, you do you would have to spend more for the hotel, but I'm sure it would be cheaper in regards to food. Um because it's probably more access to cheaper food at Liberty Forum there than there is at Porkfest. There's a lot there um there's a lot there's of a food um, at Porkfest. No food at Park Fest. No, not generally. Um, food you get from actual restaurants and from the hotel. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot more speakers and things like that. There's a couple of after parties you go to. I know the Cyclops Manarchy had a really awesome after party, which was really fun to go to. Um, but, you know, you don't deal with extreme heat. You don't heat, deal with sweat. So, you know, you have to kind of take it as it goes. Well, I, I would like to go to one of the livery forums, but I think it'll probably have to wait till I move up there. Yeah, uh, and you know, travel. Well, and traveling in New England winter can be certainly um, unpredictable. <laughs> nah, sweetie, I'm from Chicago. We drive in. I, I learned how to drive in the snow. Okay, I'm, I can drive on ice. <laughs> yeah, well, that's Wait one thing when it's like it's delayed. Wait a minute. If you live in Chicago, you know how to drive in snow and ice, which I know you do. It got down to the 30s and 40s this past weekend, and Miss Southern Belle herself was wearing sandals and no jacket in this weather, and everybody's asking me, aren't you cold? That's crazy. So why is that crazy if we're talking about winter weather and you camping in the winter, and I'm walking around in sandals and a coat without a coat? Well, you see, there's a difference between being in the middle of winter because you've already been acclimated to it, but you can camp outside for that. This was, you go from, you know, 95 one day to 55 the next day. It's a bit of a shock to the system. It felt really good to me. That's how Chicago is. If you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it'll change. Oh, it felt good to me. And I was walking around in my sandals, and they're like, why are, why are you wearing sandals? Well, you're also used to humidity as well. Oh, I hate this weather here, though. I want the cold weather that I had when I was visiting. Well, <laughs> they told us, they told us today that this is probably going to be the nicest, um, the last nicest day for the rest of the year. So, who knows? If, who knows if that's going to be true or not? But I mean, I I know I'm going to be regretting this as soon as it gets colder. But I don't really like summer. I like spring. I like fall. I really like winter. But I'm I, I'm happy to. I don't have to do hot weather for a while. Well, I will. I will say this really quickly, uh, and then I'll let you talk again, that uh, we do are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. I do want to remind everybody to listen in, stay tuned for the next show from 9 to 12 Eastern. That is 6 to 9 Pacific. It is the Proof Negative show. I used to be his Tuesday co-host, and I left that gig. But um, I do want to encourage everybody to stick around and, and listen. And We do have about four minutes left in the show, so uh, my wonderful co-host, keep running your mouth a little while. <laughs> la, 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 la. Verbal diarrhea from us. Whatever you want to talk about, it's all yours. You got three minutes. <laughs> Instant diarrhea. Okay, you know this. This is an all new low for the PM show. Well, you know, there, there's, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about the little baby. 
Baby Sarah, everybody's too. heard about that little baby that got the flashbang exploded in his poor little face. <laughs> um, yeah, oh. because that well, apparently the grand jury's come back with a verdict. No charges. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Um, that, that happened right here in the state of Georgia. That was a hot button issue for us Georgians. Oh, I'm sure it was. Holy crap. It's a nightmare. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Poor child. Poor child. And how dare they protect the people and who the did that to him. Once again, folded like a bunch of little pansies to authority and said, no, 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 we're not going to, we're not going to charge them. No, they, they're, they're, they're justified. Look, 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 look at his chest. There's that shiny badge there. You see that? That means you can do whatever. You don't have to worry. No, we can't hold, how are we going to hold them responsible? There's, there's like 30 of them. We can't hold them all responsible. Only one guy threw it in. Nobody knows who it was. It's not like we keep inventory of our, of our weaponry or anything like that. God forbid that. No, 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 no. There's no one to hold charge. So, I mean, it, and besides, it's, that kid's going to have to have two surgeries every year for the rest of his fucking life. We can't afford that. I mean, that would, that would, that would, that would bankrupt Georgia. We can't do that. We can't. I'm sorry, kid. Sorry, guys. Um, that's not our problem. Just because we, you know, broke into your house and assaulted you and your family and alleged that it was because there was a, an informant that said he had drugs, and we found no drugs and no weapons, could not charge you with anything. But that's not our fault. We're not responsible for what happens to you from our actions. But we sure as hell have authority over your body. So, and yeah, no, no, no charges. No charges. Another hideous, tragic story. These, these stories just make me mad. I mean, just from... Not only the the fact that I'm a teacher, but the fact that it, a humanitarian standpoint, it's just these kids rely rely on us to take care of them and, and help them, and we we fail them. We failed this one especially. But I will say this: we have come to the end of the show. I'm going to go ahead and play our closing music. I thank all of our listeners here tonight, and thank Danica as always, Liberty Phoenix. Thank you guys so much. You make, help make this show what it is, and I appreciate the both of you. So I'm going to play us and take us out with our friend Harrison Ray. And you guys have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Good night, everybody. Real quick, let me plug my, my brother's album, Ballistic Realist. Go to his website. It's pretty good.